nice to see you out there. You have mostly smiling faces and everything. This is pretty good. Okay, you guys heard that in my children's sermon we have a lot of things that need cleaning at our house, right? That's not the only problem. We also have a lot of things that need fixing at our house. Some major and minor. Our van has a dent in it and the exhaust system needs some work. The dog has chewed a hole in the easy chair. We have tons of clothes that are ripped or have a bus button missing and the list just goes on and on. So not just cleaning but lots of repairs to be needing to. Luckily I have a wonderful and loving husband who likes to think of himself as a handyman and oftentimes tries to fix things himself. And you see where this is going, right? Four out of five times he can usually do a decent job of repairing things, at least temporarily, right? But I have to say, um, sometimes his fixes are lacking a little bit in aesthetics, shall we say. His fixes work for a while, but eh. Well, here, it's easier to show. Here are some examples of Rob's repairs, right? Well, not exactly, but, but don't you just love this duct tape on the cars? Somebody's lovely patch job on the wallpaper down things, and uh, I think on the pants, they've actually used some staples on the bottom of the pants to hem them and just uh, you know, kind of iffy repairs. But seriously, isn't that the way a lot of our fixes tend to look? We try to super glue and duct tape things and patch things and we try all kinds of tricks to fix our broken things. And often our fixes are ugly and they don't last very long and they're just temporary. And whatever we fixed still doesn't work as well as it did before it got busted. And really just, they're barely good for putting into a rummage sale. But you know, there is another way to repair things. I learned about this by hanging around some art teachers. I read about a Japanese art for repairing broken pottery. And they call it kintsukusori. I think it's something similar to sounding like that. Kintsukusori is the Japanese word for golden repair. Golden repair. And, then, and that's what it looks like. It's basically a process where you take a lacquer resin and you dust it and you mix it with gold powder, with powdered gold, to really adhere the pieces back together again. And the idea is that breakage and repair are part of the history of an object. They're part of its identity. So rather than hiding or disguising the fact that it was broken, we should highlight that fact. It's part of what that object is. It's an art form that, that embraces the flawed and the imperfect. And by highlighting the cracks and the repairs, <clears throat> they're showing that the object is valuable still. That even its value is beyond just its brokenness or even because of its brokenness, it's still valuable. Being broken is just marked as one event in the life of the object instead of ending its useful life. And here in America, we just fill our landfills with cluttered and broken and discarded objects. But in Japan, they fix the broken objects. They repair them. And they become beautiful objects, objects of great value and beauty. The brokenness of the repaired object is highlighted. It's illuminated by gold that shows where the marks are, where the repairs were made. And it's been so beautiful that some people back in the 1800s were accused of breaking pottery on purpose just so that they could make it more beautiful with these repairs. Well, it's not that big of a leap, is it, to jump from the brokenness of a piece of pottery to human brokenness? Life batters and chips away at us and it breaks us in a variety of ways. We get broken arms and legs. We live in broken homes with broken relationships. 
our society and our systems, whether you're talking about government or education or economy, they are broken. Our spirits, our hearts get broken. And we spend a lot of time trying to fix them on our own. But we already know how it's going to turn out, even if we use duct tape. Our fixes in our lives turn out ugly. They don't last. They don't work very well. But what happens if we don't try to fix things on our own, but instead let God do the repairs? God is repairer and restorer. He's creator and recreator of all things beautiful. And all throughout scripture, the Bible talks very frequently about God being a master potter and we are clay. We are pieces of clay pottery that are fragile and broken. What happens to those broken pieces of our lives? What happens to our broken selves when we give them to God? What can he do with them? And that's what I want to look at today. So if you have your Bibles handy, or if you brought your own, or if you want to grab the one in the pew in front of you, if you want to turn to page 965 in the blue, in the blue Bibles, 965, or if you grab the large print, it's 1,784. 1,784. But we're going to be looking at Paul's le second letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, page 965 or page 1784. The book of 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> and Paul is writing to a church that's faced a lot of tough times. They've been going through difficulty. And Paul is going to share with us what happens when we turn our brokenness over to God. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. That's a powerful description to me. That passion says we are fragile clay jars, and we are. Life batters and breaks us in so many ways, but God can repair us and make us even better than before. And if we let God do that, some amazing things happen. When we allow God to repair us, three things happen. The first thing that happens is we become more useful to God. We become more useful. Now it's pretty clear that one of the primary purposes of repairing something is to get it working again, right? Whether you're talking about a car or a TV or even a broken clay pot. And if you put the things, the pieces, back together so that they look good, but you can't touch it or use it, you've kind of missed the point of repair, right? What's, what good is it? It looks good, but you can't use it. Then why bother? We at our house have got some really cool, a lot of cool coffee mugs there. But if Rob goes into the kitchen to grab one and I say, no, 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 don't touch the handle on that one, it's broken. I fixed it with some scotch tape, but it might leak if you still hold on, if you put something hot into it. He's going to be going, then why is it in the cabinet? What good is it if I can't use it? That's the purpose of a coffee mug, is to put coffee in. Some translations of this passage use the term, instead of clay jars, it says earthen vessels. And I really like, I like that word vessels. Not because um, 
well, I just do, but because it emphasizes the purpose, that it's transporting something, that it's holding something. That's what a vessel, whether you're talking a blood vessel or a earthen vessel, it's designed and it's created to hold something. It has a purpose. It's just not there for the heck of it, right? Consider for a moment the pots in your kitchen cabinet. As long as they sit there empty, they're not really fulfilling the reason why they're there. It really doesn't become useful until it's holding soup or coffee or spaghetti or whatever it is. And it's the same thing with our lives. Our lives don't make any sense. They're a contradiction until we understand that God created us to contain something, to hold something. God made you and me to contain life in Jesus Christ and to display that wonderful glory to the rest of the world. We are supposed to contain Christ and show him to others. And I think that's just an amazing illustration of that Kintsuka Kori philosophy of art. God pours his grace into the brokenness of our lives and it makes us possible again to serve, to be useful, even though we were broken. The idea is not just simply to repair a piece of pottery, it's to re repair it so that it can be useful, so that it can function. And when people are broken, God graciously fills in those broken cracks with his mercy and his love, and they too then are uniquely prepared to serve God and to serve other people. God's repairs make us more useful than we were before because now we are more capable of sharing and showing Christ's power and life to others. That's what it says in verse 7. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not ourselves. Now that we have been broken and repaired, we have a testimony of who God is and what amazing work he can do. You know, sometimes as a pastor, I know Rob and I both hear this sometimes, people say, oh, I can't really do anything for God because of my past, because of the things I've done, because of sins I've committed or whatever. And they feel like because of their brokenness, they are disqualified from service, that they are of no use to God. I'm here to tell you this morning that that does not have to be true. Being a broken person does not keep you from serving God. It's only staying broken that does that. If you stay broken, you're not useful. But if you allow God to repair you, when God forgives your sins and he restores you, you are not disqualified from service or ministry. In fact, you are actually more qualified because now you contain the good news of Christ for those people in the world that are, have been similarly broken. If you go to AA, they don't connect an alcoholic with a sponsor who has never known the brokenness of alcoholism. Someone who's been a caregiver of a spouse who suffered from Alzheimer's is uniquely equipped to support families that are going through similar things. Someone who's gone through the brokenness of of being abused by a spouse is uniquely equipped to support other victims of abuse. Someone who's experienced financial brokenness knows the despair that other people are going through in similar circumstances. You pick the brokenness, whether you're talking divorce or death or depression or whatever problem you have, God can turn it into a source of usefulness, of beauty and strength. Because whatever the brokenness, God can repair it and make you even more useful for containing that good news of Jesus Christ and displaying his light in his life. God makes you useful. Now, as vessels are repaired by God, we are not only more useful, but we also become stronger than we were before. We become stronger. We actually become more resilient than we were before because we can withstand difficulties that we would not have been able to do otherwise. And that's the point of what Paul is saying in this passage. In verses 8 and 9, listen, listen to what Paul says again. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. 
Yes, we are still fragile clay pots. But if we fall on the floor after God has repaired us, we're not going to be smashed to smithereens. No matter what life throws at us, we're going to make it through. Why? Because we have already been broken and repaired by God. You've probably heard the saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. That's because things, where do things break? They break at their weakest spots. But when you have been repaired by God, those very spots where you were weak, where you were broken, are now filled with the grace and the strength of God and his mighty power. And so you're no longer relying on your own fragile and uncertain abilities. Instead, you're relying on God. I don't know, that, that sounds great in theory, to me anyway. But there are times when I doubt, does that really work in reality? Paul says, yes, it really works in reality. Paul isn't just writing this because it sounds really good. Paul lived it himself. Paul was a broken person. He struggled with his own areas of weakness. And he, he talks about it later on in this passage. He talks about his thorn and the thorn in his flesh. And we don't know exactly what Paul's challenges were. He may have had physical difficulties. He may have had emotional issues. He may have had temptations. Maybe it was another person that was a real pain in his life. We don't know what it was that he was struggling with. But we know he was broken. And, but listen to what Paul says about his own brokenness. In chapter 12 of this same letter, starting in verse 7, Paul writes, So to keep me from being pr becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from being proud. And three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. And that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knew he was weak and broken, and he really wanted it to go away. But God answered his prayer in a very different way than he was probably expecting. God wanted to fill those broken places with his own kind of golden repair. He wanted to use his grace. And each time God said, my grace is sufficient for your need. My power works best in your weakness. God promises not a silver duct tape fix. He promises golden grace repair. And Paul responds by willingly accepting what God has to offer him. Paul accepted his brokenness with pleasure. Not because, oh yay, it's fun being broken, but because he knew that being weak and broken meant that God could repair him with his grace. Because when Paul was weak, then God could make him strong and the light of Christ would shine more brightly. As Christians, we all still have our points of weakness, just as every other person in the world. But we will not break at our points of weakness anymore. Because right at that weak point is also present our greatest strength. Jesus Christ in us. And I think it's really powerful to remember during Lent, as we focus on our sins and our weaknesses and temptations, that even at our weakest, most vulnerable spots, if we rely on Christ, then we are stronger than ever. And finally... When we allow God to repair us, not only do we become more useful and strong, we also become more beautiful. We become more beautiful. Now that's a hard one to grasp, because in our world, brokenness isn't pretty. Even if something's been repaired, we don't usually want to advertise the fact to everyone, right? We don't want people to know that we were broken. We don't want them to see those broken places. And even if they've been healed up, there's still scars showing that we were broken there. And most people think that scars are ugly. They're red and wrinkled and the skin is drawn and it looks different than the rest of your body. And they think of scars as something to be ashamed of, covered up, hidden. 
It's not something that you proudly display before the world. But that is not the case with Jesus. I want you to think about it with me for a second. After Jesus, we're getting ready for Holy Week and the Easter season coming up. After Jesus was crucified, and after he defeated death and he rose on Easter, God the Father gave him a resurrected, glorious body. What did that body look like? What did Jesus' body, his glorious, resurrected body, what did it look like? The Gospel of John tells us. This is after he's been resurrected. John chapter 20, verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Jesus' resurrected body still had the wounds, still had the scars of his suffering and his treatment on the cross. And what was the disciples' reaction when they saw those nail marks in his hands? It wasn't, ew, gross, Jesus, put some gloves on, nobody wants to see your scars. That's not how they responded. They were filled with joy. The man they thought was dead was now alive, but not just because of that. They were filled with joy because of what those scars meant. Those scars showed what a beautiful thing Jesus had done for them dying on the cross. He died so that they might live. Christ's body was broken for us, and that is beautiful. Those scars were beautiful and joyful reminders of what he had done for them. Guess what, guys? Christians are scarred people. We are. We are scarred because we were broken and we were wounded. But we didn't stay that way. God repaired us. He healed us. And that's what our scars show. Our scars show that God has healed us. And our scars are not red and ugly things that we should be ashamed of. They are golden and intricate and beautiful. They're not good and beautiful because, hey, it's wonderful to be broken and sinful. No, they are beautiful because God is good and what he has done for us is beautiful. And our scars are a testimony to our healing. Our scars remind people of Jesus' scars. They tell the story of the work of Christ. They don't shout out to the world that we're damaged goods that we deserve to be in the bargain bin or on the rummage sale table. Our scars shout to the world that we are valuable, priceless works of art, that we are new creations in God, and our scars display his glory and grace in a powerful and a beautiful way. Now, I confess, I don't like to show my scars to many people because I, I don't want to admit that I'm not perfect, that I've made mistakes. I don't want people to know about my brokenness. I don't want people to know about battles with depression, painful relationships, angers, and so much more that I have had going on in my life. I don't want to open up w wounds, but neither should I be ashamed of my scars because they are a testimony to what God has done in my life. Some of the strongest, most beautiful people that I know are those that have been broken but have had their brokenness repaired by God's grace. Every single one of us are chipped and cracked and broken in some way. But it's in and through our flaws that God's grace glorifies Him and blesses other people. You are broken in some way. I know you are. You may deny it. You may disguise it. You might try and hide it. But God's desire for you is to let Christ fill your brokenness with his grace so that you can be made beautiful and strong and useful to God and other people. When I look in the mirror in the morning, it's very clear to see that I see a broken person. And when I look out at the congregation here, you know what I see? I see a bunch of broken people. I see a bunch of broken people. But I see a mix of silver and gold. 
Some of you are broken people desperately trying to hold your life together with silver duct tape. You're trying to keep things going. You're trying to keep things working on your own. And it doesn't work, does it? Your life is still in pieces. But I look at some of you, and even though you're broken, I see hints of gold. I see people who have said, I can't fix this. My life is broken, and only God can repair me. And they've let Jesus into their broken lives to transform them, to transform their weakness and their brokenness into something strong and beautiful. And so they display their golden scars for other people to see so that they too can exchange their cheap silver duct tape for the priceless gold that is life in Jesus Christ. I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, we do confess to you that each one of us is a broken person. But we are not going to try and fix things on our own. God, we want to give you our brokenness. Lord, we want to give you our weaknesses. Lord, we want to give you all kinds of things. We're bringing you our financial gifts, our acts of service, and all of these things as we look at them, don't seem to be very much. But we know that you can transform our tithes, you can transform our abilities, you can even transform our brokenness into things that are useful and beautiful and build your kingdom. So Lord, we put all that we are and all that we have into your hands and ask that you would repair us and make us a new creation in Jesus Christ. Amen.